It's really daunting to be speaking to a, a group of women. I don't usually do this. Um, but I think we live in a time today when we have opportunities and privileges that our mothers and our grandmothers fought for, prayed for, and could scarcely dream of. We also probably share some of the same hang-ups that they struggled with. My mother told me the story of a woman walking along a beach and she kicked against a bottle and a genie popped out, obviously a true story. And she looked at the genie and said, oh good, um, I've got, I, I would love to make a wish before he even had the chance to, to offer it to her. He said, okay, what do you wish for? She said, without hesitation, I wish that I had thin thighs. <laughs> Hope we all identify with that. Um, and the genie said, listen, that is so unbelievably selfish. You could have wished for anything. You could have ended third world debt. You could have sorted out the banking crisis. You could have ended child poverty. You could have given immunizations to children in Africa. I think you should take your wish again. And she thought for a moment and said, yes, actually, that was a little bit selfish. Let me take the wish again. I wish for thin thighs for everyone. <laughs> Well, I've been asked to speak tonight um, on this subject of overcoming life's challenges, and it's quite a broad subject. And I've been really praying and wrestling over uh, what to speak on and how to approach this subject. And what, asking the Lord, what does he want to say to us tonight, specifically those who've come here to this place on the 11th of February 2013? What does it mean to overcome life's challenges? There's an assumption behind this title. There's an assumption that is correct, that is, that as Christians in the 21st century, just like all other Christians who've gone before us, we will face trials and challenges. Now, for some of us, that's a surprise. Perhaps we've heard a gospel which seemed to say, come to Jesus and life will be really easy. He'll just sort everything out immediately. And as soon as you follow Christ, your life will be a bed of roses surrounded by fluffy bunnies jumping everywhere and nothing will ever be difficult. The subject of tonight's talk assumes that that isn't the case. It assumes that just like every other Christian who's gone before us, we will face trials and challenges. And our task as Christians is to overcome. I'd love you to open your Bibles, if you have them, at Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 to 11. And here we read some amazing verses. The context is that the Apostle John is having an extraordinary open vision of heaven. This is a, a, the man who laid his head on the chest of Jesus, who's grown into old age, for whom his fellow disciples, those who follow Christ with him, nearly all of them have faced some kind of gruesome death. And he alone is the one to reach old age as a believer. And as he's exiled on the island of Patmos, the Lord appears to him in extraordinary glory. He has this vision of Jesus. His head is white like snow and his eyes are blazing fire. You might be familiar with it. But as this vision of heaven goes on, he sees all kinds of things, sort of heavenly visions of this titanic struggle over life between good and evil. Now, there's no equivocation about who's in charge and who's won. It's utterly clear that Jesus Christ is victorious over darkness through the cross and resurrection. But nonetheless, until Jesus comes back, we see this titanic struggle between the powers of darkness and the powers of glory. And John describes in chapter 12, verses 10 to 11, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. We have this extraordinary vision of the accuser of the brethren. That's the one who's the enemy, the prince of darkness, if you like. He's hurled down. And who is victorious? 
It's people, it's believers, it's Christians like you and I. And how do they overcome the enemy? They overcome him in two ways. The first is by the blood of the Lamb, the cross of Jesus Christ. It's all the work of Jesus. But the second is by the word of their testimony. The practical application of the power of the cross, of what Jesus has done on the cross, in your life and in my life. Real testimony as to what he has done. That's what overcomes the enemy. So for the Christian, overcoming the challenges of life, overcoming the enemy, is rooted in the cross. This week I was talking um, on the phone to a producer for a Radio 4 program that I'm going to be involved in. And we were talking about all kinds of things, and then, um, as often happens, the phone call went on, and we somehow got on to talking about the cross. And uh, she found herself asking me, well, you know, why do Christians always come back to the cross? What's it all about? So I had this amazing opportunity. I was pacing around my room at home thinking, Lord, help me here, and trying to keep my son quiet, hoping he wouldn't disturb what was happening. And I was explaining to her how at the cross, Jesus takes into himself the pain and the suffering and the evil and the shame of every person. And he delivers us from those things at the cross and offers us forgiveness. I was saying for the Christian, the cross isn't just a moral example. It's not a nice story that we tell. It's the root of all the power of God to transform normal people's lives. She said, wow, how extraordinary. I said, yeah, when we talk about the cross, we're talking about an event in history, an event in ultimate reality that that isn't just words. It's the very power of God to transform the person. I was about to do an appeal with her, and then we got back onto um, the subject we were discussing. But we see here that we overcome as believers through the blood of Jesus But then through the word of our testimony, how is this worked out in my life and in your life? This is not just philosophical, ethereal principles, not just propositions. This is reality worked out in the blood and sweat and gore of your life and mine. But you know, there are rivals to this view of the Christian faith, even within the church. We can be in danger not of, we can be in danger of not receiving the power of God through the cross, his forgiveness, his enabling of us to overcome. Instead of receiving that, of beginning to create a God in our own image. Now today, one of the favorite arguments of atheists is that religion is a delusion. You know, it's all about wish fulfillment. You wish that there was a God, and out of your desire for a God to exist, you just project him, you imagine him, and then you pray to him, but that imagination does you some good, but there's no reality to it. This comes from um, the brilliant psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, who said, all belief in God is just a projection of a desire for a father figure to exist. Now, of course, that argument cuts both ways, We could say to Freud, well, your desire to be an atheist is rooted in your desire for a father figure not to exist. Whatever our desire is irrelevant. The question is, is God actually there and is he real? There's a titanic struggle in the church even over this though. A theologian from Princeton um, called Kenda Dean writes this. She's talking about the American church, but I think it applies to us as well. The problem does not seem to be that churches are teaching their young people badly, but that they are doing an exceedingly good job of teaching youth what we really believe, namely that Christianity is not a big deal, that God requires little, and the church is a helpful social institution filled with nice people focused primarily on folks like us. What if the blasé religiosity of most American teenagers is not the result of poor communication, but the result of excellent communication of a watered-down gospel, so devoid of God's self-giving love in Christ Jesus, so immune to the sending love of the Holy Spirit, that it might not be Christianity at all? If this is the case, then perhaps most young people practice what she calls 
moralistic, therapeutic deism, not because they reject Christianity, but this is the only Christianity they know. Forgive the jargon, but let's just examine this term for a moment. In 2005, several sociologists of religion did some work on American teenagers and faith, and they polled churchgoers and non-churchgoers, teenagers from different denominations. It wasn't the largest survey out there, but they discovered something astounding, and they called this cluster of ideas moralistic, because it was moral, therapeutic, because it was primarily about therapy to the self, deism, because it was about a god, but not really a personal god. And what they discovered is people believed a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life. That there's a God who wants people to be good and nice and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. That the central goal of life is to be happy and feel good about oneself. And that God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life, except when God is needed to resolve a problem. She goes on to write, American teenagers' de facto religious creed, moralistic therapeutic deism, a view that religion is a very nice thing, makes us feel good, but leaves God in the background. It is a self-serving approach to religious faith, a view of God as a divine butler, invisible and less called on, whose primary purpose is to make us feel good and sanction the things we want to do anyway. She says, if this is the God they're seeing in church, they're right to leave us in the dust. Churches don't give them enough to be passionate about. Contrast that idea of the God projected from our own imagination with the God talked about by John in that vision of Revelation. The one through whom the cross of Jesus Christ enables you and I to overcome the enemy in this cosmic battle. Are we creating an idol, a wish fulfillment kind of God, or are we responding to the real, living, loving God who has a calling on our lives, who transforms us, who calls us to take up our cross and follow him, and who promises us the very power of the cross if we will receive him, if we will welcome him in? The one who calls us to anticipate both suffering and miracles through that power of the cross. Three years ago, um, I had the privilege of going to um, help teach in an underground church conference in China. And um, there was a gathering of about 250 leaders, and between them, these 250 leaders had direct oversight over 60 million Christians. They were amazing people. 40% of them were women, you'll be encouraged to hear. And these leaders were extraordinary individuals. I met a man on a pair of crutches who uh, described to me the first time he saw someone raised from the dead. And he went on to describe what it was like to escape from prison without any of the communist guards seeing him as he was able to walk through locked gates. He was a, 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 a really humble man on these crutches, and we had this amazing conversation, and uh, afterwards he got into the elevator to go, and I was incredibly humbled, and a translator came up to me and said, by the way, see that guy over there? He's got 10 million people in his church. <laughs> I felt about this big. I met a lady there who was the same age as me, who had a child the very similar age to one of my children. Who, um, whose husband was imprisoned for his Christian faith. And she said to me, um, can you help me? I've got a question I'd love you to answer. And I thought, gosh, I think you need to help me, but okay, we'll, we'll try and work something out here. She said, I need to hear from you what I should pray. And I said, what do you mean? What's your situation? She said, my husband is in prison. I'm left overseeing all the churches, and every week they're growing. People are becoming Christians, but we don't have enough money, and you know, I don't know where my next meal is coming from, but every week more people are becoming Christians, and I just feel this pressure, and I feel this incredible loneliness. I'm missing my husband. And I, I said, well, yes, okay. She said, here's my question. Is it right for me to pray for my husband to be released from prison or not? I looked at her and said, what on earth do you mean? Of course it's right. She said, wait a minute, you haven't heard the rest of the story. 
My husband was taken to prison over a year ago. I heard nothing, but recently I was able to visit him. And when I visited him, I discovered that he had led 60% of the prison to Christ and the prison warden. She said, he's now leading a church in prison. Should I pray that he stays there or that he gets out? That question shook me to the core. It absolutely shook me. What should I pray? The expectation in that woman that millions of people would come to Christ, that miracles would happen, but that suffering was a part of her faith staggered me. How do you view the Christian faith? What does it look like to you to be an overcomer? What does it mean to be a Christian woman today? Flick over again in your Bibles to Proverbs 31, and we're going to look for a few moments at the Bible's idea of an ideal woman. And then I'm going to introduce to you um, four things that I think the Lord laid on my heart as specific challenges um, that some of us may be facing to overcome. I'm going to speak personally from my own life as well. At the end of the book of Proverbs, we see the dis- one of the descriptions in the Bible of what it looks like to be a godly person. And wonderfully for us, the person chosen is a woman. Often the examples of faith held up are men, but in this occasion, it's a woman. She's a wife, but we can all take the principles of her character seriously, whether we're married or not. What does it say? Proverbs 31, a wife of noble character who can find. She's worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her. She lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She's like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still dark and provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. Now, you may already notice that this woman isn't your classical stereotype of a Christian woman of whom the church seems to approve. Where's the bit about not going to work? Where is it that it says you must wear frumpy clothes and open-toed sandals at all times? In fact, here, we have an amazing affirmation in scripture of a high achieving woman and the Bible characterizes her as precious. Do you hear that women of HTB? Those of you in whom God has placed in your heart to achieve something with your life, to pursue a vocation, God calls that precious. He has a destiny for you. Notice all the verbs in this passage. She's full of energy. She's described working, bringing, getting up early, providing. She's a whirlwind of activity. This woman is commended for her success and held up to us as an example. In verse 17, we read, she sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She doesn't have bingo wings. Brilliant. (laughs) She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp doesn't go out. In her hands, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hand to the needy. And when it snows, her household has no fear. They're clothed in scarlet. This woman has business acumen. Her trading is profitable. She invests in property. She provides for others, for her family, for her employees. She's creating wealth. She's got good arms. <laughs> she makes, in verse 22, bed coverings that are fine linen, and it says her husband is respected. She's even got nice bed linen, ladies. <laughs> she, um, she's clothed with strength and dignity, and she can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She's knowledgeable. She pursues the wisdom of God in the scriptures and she's able to encourage others. What an incredible role model for us today. What a challenge. The standards seem unachievably high. I'm already feeling low self-esteem as I read about her. But she isn't there in the Bible to make us feel bad about ourselves. She's there, I believe, for both men and women to hold up an example of someone who is a person of character 
vocation, passion, and energy. She's there to remind us that it's possible to wholeheartedly pursue the kingdom of God and wholeheartedly pursue the career God has put in your heart and to pursue family if God puts that in your heart. She's there to show us that with God's empowering and his blessing, we can enter fully into service of him. Now that's the ideal. So hold that in your mind and then hold again in your mind that picture that John has of a battle raging over the earth between the powers of darkness and the power of light. So here's the ideal. A woman who knows what she's called to, whose children rise up and call her blessed, who's able to instruct people, who gives to the poor, who's successful at what she does, who's fulfilled in what she does. But remember, we're in a battle that we need to overcome an enemy. Now, here's the question that began to occur to me as I was preparing this. How would the enemy go about targeting women in the 21st century like you and I, called to be like that Proverbs 31 woman, but finding ourselves in this battle, called to overcome by the power of the the blood of the Lamb, Jesus' cross, and the word of our testimony, how would the enemy go about distracting us? Now, interestingly, the brilliant apologist C.S. Lewis wrote a book exactly about this. It's called The Screwtape Letters, if any of you have read it. It's funny, but it's also incredibly challenging. In this book, there's a senior demon who's instructing a junior demon about how to keep the human targets from fulfilling their destiny and living a life sold out for Christ. If Screwtape were targeting the women of our generation, What might he focus on? Now, we can look in the Bible and see what the women in the Bible struggled with. We can open our Bibles in the Old Testament and we can read about our forebears. We can read about Rachel, who struggled with infertility, which I believe is a similar struggle in the church today for for those who struggle with singleness. Or it may be a biological struggle with infertility. She struggled with this, and the struggle was so immense to her that she almost screams out to heaven, give me children or I will die. She felt the pain of her struggle so deeply. And then she goes on to have two children of struggle. One is Joseph, the other is Benjamin, both children of promise. She dies giving birth to her second son. She calls him Ben-Omi, son of my struggle. But Jacob renames him son of my right hand, Benjamin. Honor, promise, identity in this titanic struggle for this woman. Or Hannah, who we read about, struggles with this mystery person that the Bible calls her rival, a woman who taunts her and plagues her in her time of deepest sorrow, a woman who appeared to be her friend but was the Bible's first frenemy, opposing her and making her life a misery. Hannah pursues God's presence in the agony of unfulfilled desire and broken friendship. What about Esther? She's in a position of power politically, and she's uniquely placed to do good. And she experienced this, this extraordinary vocational struggle against a great national evil. And she's called to speak out and act to avert it. Or what about Phoebe, who Paul talks about in Romans chapter 16, a woman he describes as the leader of the Roman church. And he calls her prostatis, which means a leader of great authority over many, including myself. Imagine having Paul in your congregation. (laughs) A woman called to extraordinary leadership responsibility. That was what some of the women of old in the Bible struggled with and needed to overcome in. And as I was um, praying for you, I sensed the Lord lay four, perhaps five, we'll see, but definitely four areas on my heart 
where the enemy would seek to distract, to divert, to use up our attention, and the Lord wants us to overcome. So the first is an obsession with externals, image. An obsession with that question, am I thin, successful, attractive, fertile, wealthy, influential, or clever enough? Add in your own. A constant question over your identity, eating away at the core of who you are. Remember the titanic struggle. Remember the woman of noble character, that promise of destiny, of fulfilling incredible purpose and significance in your generation. And remember there's an enemy who you need to overcome, who wants to distract you from that. This snake in the garden in Genesis uses that question, did God really say, and he uses that question today, did God really say that I'm precious, that I belong to him, that my security is rooted in him? There are different issues at different stages in our careers and lives, but over all of them is that central question, can I really trust God with who I am? Or is there always that insecurity eating away at me? Am I thin enough? Am I successful enough? Am I attractive enough? Am I fertile enough? Am I wealthy enough? Am I influential enough? Am I clever enough? Am I wasting my time being distracted from the pursuit of something significant that God has for me by all of those questions? For me... um, this question is different at different stages in life. I often um, have to go into quite hostile situations and kind of represent the Christian faith and answer people's questions about Christianity. And there are frequently highly skeptical atheists who are often very aggressive in the audience that I'm dealing with. And so that question, am I clever enough? Can I really do this? Am I articulate enough? Is a a question that if I allow it to eat away at who I am, I will not be able to fulfill God's purpose over my life. But a number of years ago, after the birth of my twins, and by the way, I was enormous. Pippa saw me. Um, (laughs) I remember her face when she saw how (laughs) enormous I was. It was quite shocking. Um, I mean, I literally came out beyond here um, by the end. And after the birth of my twins, I went back to work part-time, and they traveled with me. And I remember a tremendous struggle with feelings of worry. Should I be working at all? What do people think? Can I really do this with children? I knew this was my calling, but there was a struggle. And then there was the question, will I still be able to do this work? Have I forgotten everything? Has my philosopher's brain totally melted down with with the process of of feeding, etc.? Will I be terribly nervous? Can I stand up in front of people? And an invitation came shortly before I went back to work. And I remember Frog's knowing smile when the invitation came. I was invited to go to Washington, D.C., And one of the events that they wanted me to do was to speak at the White House in the West Wing. Now, um, if you're feeling remotely insecure, that's not a a good place to be. (laughs) Um, So anyway, we ended up going and we were flying in and I was holding Elijah on my lap. And we were about to land, we were in the stack, you know, that horrible circle that you do over the airport. And um, we were about to land, and um, the next, we had to go straight to the White House to get our passports vetted so I could speak the next day. And my son threw up over me, so head to toe, I was covered in vomit. I arrived needing to meet these incredibly important officials in a totally disheveled state. And that question was eating away. I'm too fat to do this right now. I'm serious, that was a big question. I'm at my absolute worst in terms of how I look. Can I really do this? How does John say we overcome? Through the blood of the Lamb, through what Jesus has done. 
in my weakness, overweight, afraid, a completely unlikely choice to represent the gospel at any kind of level, let alone in a foreign country. He showed me that his purpose for my life transcends those questions about my self-image. What would the enemy need to do to distract you from that Proverbs 31 calling on your life? Or he could start by calling into question who you are. To overcome in this area of identity is to surrender our identity completely to the Lord. To actively put a stop to behaviors motivated by finding security in any of those other places. To overcome is to refuse to allow those questions about our identity and worth to determine who we are going to be and how we're going to live. Well, the second area that the Lord laid on my heart and speeding up here now is this area of relationships that I mentioned what, that Hannah struggled with. And in particular, that idea of the rival that is introduced in the narrative about Hannah in the temple. I encourage you to go and read it in 1 Samuel chapter 1 if you've never read it. We have there a, a fascinating insight into the pain of betrayal by a close friend. Now, this happened to Jesus, so we shouldn't be surprised if we experience this kind of pain, a dear friend that we have trusted turning against us. This happened in my life a few years ago when someone wanted power in our church and used a friendship with me to gain access into my circle of influence and leadership and then completely betrayed me. And my children were hurt in the process as well. Now, at that point, I'd given numerous talks on forgiveness. I had walked through the valley of forgiving deep wounds in the past. But that intentional destruction by a friend who had now become my enemy, who had pretended to be my friend, really deeply shocked me. The power of someone to shake us to the core through a betrayal and to cause me to question the possibility of forgiveness was a huge distraction and it was a very successful tactic by the enemy. But what does John say? We overcome through the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. I turn to a close friend, and Pip mentioned the friend she's going to be speaking here in October, Beth Redman. I spoke to her and poured out my heart to her, and she turned me on to 1 Samuel chapter 1 and that whole thing of the rival, and she prayed for me, and she led me through a process of forgiving this person. And she describes in her book, God Knows My Name, the betrayal in her case by her father. She writes this, for 17 years, my dad and I had had sporadic contact. Throughout that time, contact had been nothing but destructive, so I trodden carefully and agonizingly lived my adult life without him. During the pregnancy of our third child, I began to have some worrying symptoms, and after the baby's birth, the doctors tested me for suspected liver disease. The specialist I was seeing told me before my liver biopsy he needed to know as much about my medical background as possible and that I was to contact all my living relatives and find out if anyone in the family had ever had liver problems. I contacted each family member and also very nervously included an email to my dad. He wrote back immediately and still to this day I can't believe his parting words. He wrote that yes, there was liver disease in the family and also cancer and he hoped I had both. Beth, he said, you deserve to suffer because suffering would make someone as egotistical and vile as you a better person. While waiting for the, liver result, the results of my liver condition, my earthly father had cursed me and condemned my life. But God made us to love and be loved. My dad knew me, rejected me, and detested me. Could anything be more painful? I cried out to God, my true, amazing Father, my heavenly, forever Father, the one who knows all my failures and shortcomings but has never rejected me, who wrote my name on the palms of his hands and stretched out his arms as they pulled apart and viciously nailed to a cross. He was separating my sin forever and loving me enough to die unjustly. 
Everything I would ever need in life was now accessible and available to me through his death. God spoke powerfully to me through Isaiah 49, 15. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she's born? Though she may forget you, I will not forget you. See, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. My friend who'd experienced rejection and betrayal could leave and overcome through the blood of the Lamb, through the power of her testimony, could lead me in a process of forgiving the betrayal and the hurt of a broken friendship. If the enemy wanted to distract you from being a woman like Proverbs 31, entering fully into the significant calling on your life, he might do it with a broken friendship, a rival, a betrayal. Well, how about, very briefly, the consequences of living in a fallen world and suffering from a disease that causes us to question, if God really loves me, why am I suffering from this disease? After all, God could prevent it, couldn't he? Or he could stop it from happening, couldn't he? And he doesn't. For me, I was 16, and um, I had a, a mole on my leg that um, was a bit suspicious. And my mother took me to the doctor. It was investigated. And I remember going into the consultant's room and being told, I'm afraid it's cancer. And in that moment, as a teenager, experiencing the most incredible fear of death, the fear of my life being cut short. I went home that night and prayed and cried out to God, could he meet me in a place of suffering? Could he meet me in a struggle with disease? Could I experience his love and his deliverance when my worst fear seemed to be coming true? Remember reading in Habakkuk 3, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The sovereign Lord is my strength and he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Years later, going through a period of four and a half years of infertility and then miscarriage, numerous miscarriages, I remember feeling as I lay in bed this blackness almost pressing down on me like death that I just couldn't shake off. And remembering what it had been like as a 16-year-old to experience God's deliverance in that place of disease... At that time in my life, my prayers for others were answered, miracles of healing and salvation and for babies and all sorts of things all over the place. And yet for me, there seemed to be this closed door, no answer, just relentless blackness. Overcoming in that situation meant reaching a place of honesty with God, saying, I don't understand this, but I want to trust you. Learning that even in the darkest place, God could hold me, receiving his comfort in the valley of tears. And I need to remember that we overcome through the blood of the Lamb. That's only possible because of Jesus. Christianity is unique. It's the only worldview in which God experiences suffering. God is with us in suffering. Suffering is not external to him. At the cross, God himself suffers. And so as we suffer, he can be with us in a way that is genuine and meaningful. And so this week, as I visit my friend whose baby is dying, or I talk to another friend who's just been through the horrific attack, completely out of the blue, I know that it is possible in that place of darkness, even though we question, why God? Why has this happened? I know that it's possible for us to overcome because Jesus has walked through that suffering and he can be with us in that darkness. 
And then finally, and as we close, fear. The enemy wants to use fear to stop you doing what you're called to do. Maybe the fear of man, the fear of what other people will think, a fear of danger, a fear of disappointment, a fear of loneliness. But the promise of Jesus is that through the cross, God can deliver us from fear. The promise of a Christian life is not there'll be no darkness and there's nothing to be afraid of, so live a jolly nice life. The promise of Jesus is that in the midst of that deepest darkness, he can be with you and deliver you from fear. And the challenge of Christ is, don't allow yourself to be distracted from the great vision and purpose of significance that he has over your life by being afraid. Don't let the enemy put fear into your life so that you're unable to pursue the dream God wants to place in your heart, the things that he wants you to do. Don't dream dreams that are too small that would be doable without his deliverance, that would be doable without him enabling you to overcome. Live a life in full pursuit of him that is only possible if God comes through for you. So let's go back to those verses in Revelation and we're going to pray. Remember the promise of this extraordinary vision of heaven, this extraordinary vision of this titanic struggle in Revelation um, chapter 12. Why don't you stand and I'm going to read it over you and then we're going to pray. I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. The very power of God at work in us.